From TE Connectivity, this is Maker to Maker, conversations between engineers about engineering and the beautifully messy process that is design. I'm your host, Brooke Glassman, and today we're taking a little break from our usual one-on-one -on -one engineering chats to look back on some of our favorite conversations we've had so far. And since it's May, with so many engineers graduating to enter the workforce, we'd like to focus on what our previous guests love the most about being engineers. As we look back, we'll be hearing from Brett Dorr, Asher Einhorn, Ryan McIntosh, Beta Pormentia, and Ting Gao. So let's reminisce a little bit and take in how great it is to be makers. And to all the new grads, congratulations. So Brett, when we were talking the other day, you made a comment that I really liked, and it was that there's an emotional component to the machines and that you feel like you're in a conversation with materials. And from my point of view, you know, I, I agree that engineering is a story and what you build and what you create, there's, a, there's always something deeper behind it. So I would love for you to maybe elaborate on, on that point. An important thing that, that happens when, we're, when you're making something, and I think one of the reasons why um, actually, do, actually it's not enough just to, just to design something. Um, that that having some um, familiarity with materials and all that stuff, um, and actually touching matter and and all and and things like that are so important. Is that you know they materials have personality, um, and there's not really one piece of wood that is identical to another piece of wood. You know you can't. It, it's and even with you know there's certain there's certain ways that uh, that materials behave, and if you're if you're sort of locked into this sort of notion of design without without making something, without without trying to make something too, it you end up getting into all kinds of trouble with the materials not really cooperating with you. I want to talk a little bit about how you ended up in engineering. Yeah, so I was always just kind of a, a tinkerer as a kid, and and loved to just take things apart and see how they worked. I had recently, um, kind of at the end of high school, taken up cycling and had a ton of passion for that in, at a hobbyist level uh, and saw just how much potential there was for engineering to happen within that hobby. Um, I had a professor my freshman year show us a bike and say everything, almost everything you learn in the mechanical engineering program is in this single object. You have heat transfer, you have uh, design, you have fluids in your brake lines with hydraulics, stuff like that. There's so much to learn even within an object that you'd think is relatively simple. Um, so I kind of saw that as an opportunity to, um, to jump into kind of entry-level engineering roles that I would be just fueled by my passion for the sport. I'd say the most frequent thing that gets me into my shop and tinkering with something or building or designing something is just raw curiosity. Um, it's usually, I, I kind of consider myself almost a scientist before an engineer. And I like answering my own questions or just questions in general. And I like visuali visualizing scientific phenomena. And for me, I can't always, in fact, infrequently can I itch that scratch by watching a video or something of someone else doing something. Um, I'm very much a hands-on, visual stimuli kind of person, always have been, and I, I hope I always will be. And so often I will want to just visualize something, for example, electricity arcing through air. Almost anyone, most people will look at that and feel mingled fear and a little excitement or something. But I think almost anyone could agree it's, it's, it's interesting. It's fascinating that you can have ions just zip through the air. Electrons pass through the air because of uh, electrical potential difference. And one day I just decided, you know what? These mechanisms are cheap that can produce these voltages that you need in order to create a spark gap. I'm just going to put one together. I want to put one together. I want to get the battery that will provide the electrons to do this. I want to see this happen and control the whole process and none of it's magic and none of it is 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 uh, none of it's alien it's all just human earth science you have a curiosity go and build something and see see what you can do so usually it's just raw curiosity that brings me into my shop 
often also it's problem solving. Um, I like building furniture. I build my bed frame and my desk. Built a shoe rack for us upstairs and a little rack that holds my guitar. So I'm, I'm also kind of a woodworker and I like solving problems around the house. Um, that's also probably the second thing that brings me into my shop is just this could be better. I'm going to make it better. Or uh, this doesn't exist. I'm going to manifest one so that I can have one. Um, so it's sometimes to solve problems, sometimes because I'm just bored and curious. But those are probably the two things that most frequently get me from sitting to just coming into my shop and, and losing myself in a project here and there. Can you talk a little bit about how aesthetics and customer perception come into play when you're making your decisions and designing? I've always been big into design, um, you know, and design in its, in its many forms, right? So we're talking form, fit, and function. Um, but obviously when it comes to uh, user perception, you know, the first thing they're gonna notice is how a product looks. And so that connection, you know, making sure that not only does your product work, um, you know, does it work well, you know, but can it also engage with a customer in a way that's very clean? Right. And something that they can, you know, they can um, almost not only use it functionally, but also it, it's like some people will like to look at it as, as a work of art. And, you know, and so for me, it's always like um, as an engineer, uh, I like to think very pragmatically when it comes to my problem solving skills. But there's also a part of me that's very in tune with, uh, I want to say, the, the aesthetics and the industrial design side, you know, no exposed wires, you know, nothing that gives off the impression that it's a product that's um, sub quality. And so, you know, for me in my own specific line of work, you know, I pay very uh, particular attention to that. You know, it, the product has to work well, you know, and if it can look great, that is an, an absolute added bonus. I definitely feel like sometimes the hardest part of of any project is just getting started. I don't know, sometimes the blank screen, right? It's, it's intimidating, it's really open-ended. And when you can just start, as long, once you get something down, it just gets a little bit easier. The ideas start flowing and at least you have somewhere and like something to work with. So I think that that's really important to consider. Absolutely. And another thing is, if you, I want to add it, you know, don't be afraid about the failure. Is the thing is when you try it and, you know, I'll be honest, right? The thing is, uh, you know, if the work doesn't work, kill it. And uh, it's nothing wrong with that. But you have a clear conclusion to say, OK, this is not the technology path we will go. But at least, you know, there's, you know, you don't need to try this road for, you know, endless for two years or more. You know, OK, that's not the direction. So we need to find other direction. So sometimes, you know, know where not go is also very knowledgeable for that. I'm very fond of, the, of this idea of, of the, enabling, the enabling constraint, you know, that there, it's sort of you, you need to be able to kind of, you know, if you don't have any constraints, it's really hard. Um, so you need to sort of figure out what are the things that are kind of narrowing things down. And what and and a lot of that has to do with rules and figuring out what you know the you know when you're it's like uh, you know let's talk about like world building in like comic books and stuff like that and it's sort of like well yeah you you're you're doing all these you're you're building a world and you're choosing what the laws of what the laws of that world are. You know, it's sort of like uh, if you're doing like a superhero movie, it's sort of like, that's great. But you still have to have certain things that the superheroes can't do. You yeah. have to have, you know, if the superhero is, that's one of the criticisms when people are like with Superman. They're like, you know, he's just invincible. Like nothing can kill him. Like you have to have kryptonite, you know, right. and he can't pick up. There's not a way, you know, and, and maybe there's a way that you can figure out how he can interact with kryptonite. In a, you know, maybe he can find some gloves or something. I don't know. Maybe, right. you know, maybe There's that's, but they have to be consistent. Thing. Yeah, you have yeah. to be consistent within those things and, and be true to those, to those constraints. And I think that's kind of what has drawn me to this kind of work, which is that, you know, whatever I want to do, I still have to obey. There are still things that I can't get around. One of the things that I like to ask people 
who come onto the podcast, I like to ask, you know, when you look in the mirror and you reflect on everything that you've accomplished so far in your career and everything that you've done, what would you say your X factor is that has helped make you so successful as an engineer and as a scientist? What has helped you really stand out and really excel? I'm not sure whether I'm successful or not. I think, you know, there's a, <laughs> there's a still, you know, continuous journey for me to grow. Um, but there's a couple of things that I value a lot. Uh, one thing is, as mentioned, I'm always curious about a lot of uh, thing. I think this kind of curiosity making my daily life very fresh. So um, I, I, I would encourage people always, you know, being curious about uh, what can be done differently. And, uh, you know, if you always ask and say, hey, what can I do differently? And then, you know, that might give you some kind of a different thought uh, you, you never had before. And uh, another thing is uh, always being open-minded. And a lot of time we say, hey, you know, we cannot do this, we cannot do that. And, uh, and, and on the other hand is, uh, um, there are a lot of things you can do. So think about is, uh, you know, where you can approach and then to get things done. Uh, so, so this is, uh, and also you, see, you in this world, you're not alone. There are so many different uh, experts and then there are so many knowledges around, leverage them, you know, reach out and to talking to, you know, this person or that scientist or that engineer and to ask and say, what, what does this matter? Teach me, educate me about, you know, what this technology is. And uh, those kind of things will, will make you, you know, much powerful because, uh, you know, you are not like need to get another degree or, you know, <laughs> reading tons of the books to get the knowledge. And those people can give you some conclusion in half an hour and uh, give you the, the most uh, practical um, knowledge, you know, in the short term. So I think that is always a good thing is being open-minded. And another thing is uh, always uh, try it takes the challenge, it takes the opportunity. Um, another time is uh, you always doubt about myself. At least uh, sometimes I doubt about, about myself is whether I can do it or not. I think it's very important to always ask why, why you're doing something. Um, when you don't, when you move on, when you look for the right answer and don't ask why, it fosters ignorance, it fosters mindlessness. It takes time to ask yourself why you're doing something or why something happened. And it takes time to yeah, dig up that, that answer, but ultimately it will often save you time because it will give you the context that you need to do something better in the future. And this has been a huge struggle and challenge actually, engineering wise. The art of it is relatively simple for me and I'm not that great of an artist. You know, anything becomes very dynamic the more closely you look at it. I, I find simplicity and complexity to not be inherent traits. I find them to be matters of perspective. Anything can be simple or complex. It completely depends on the disposition of the person who is assessing them. Um, a worm could be simple or complex. The infinite cosmos could be simple or complex. It depends on how you're going to contextualize it and how you're going to discuss it. And so it is a piece of art born from the scientific method and the satisfaction I get from that is hard to put into words. It's very, very satisfying to lose yourself in something and have both of those bits of your brain going, that romantic side that's, that's subtle and quieter and is just looking at shapes and colors, and that more analytical side, which, which can be loud and, uh, and kind of foreboding and keeps you tempered and keeps you slowing down and making sure you're not making mistakes. And you kind of just settle into this little nook right in between those, this romantic and this more uh, analytical side, left brain, right brain. And it's, it's dead satisfying, let me tell you. And it doesn't mean that what you're doing is particularly like difficult or, or unobtainable or anything like that. It's just a, it's a mindset that people don't frequently ask them, uh, d demand of themselves, you know what I'm saying? People don't frequently give themselves the opportunity to settle into that little nook between romantic and analytical thought. Um, but I think it's, I, I don't think it's discussed enough. I think more people should try to find it. It takes some discipline, but I really think more people should try to find it. It's a bit of a journey, you know, as, as with everything. Um, as you said, you had to try and fail and refine and, and look at your process. But through that journey, you were able to accomplish what you were hoping to do. And it sounds like 
it serves as a bit of a stress relief and something that you can be really proud of in the end. I, I want this to be more accessible to people in the future. In fact, it's been a, almost like a business venture I've entertained in the past of just creating kind of more, more maker spaces, I guess, that kind of space, but with kind of a, a greater artistic innuendo to it. Um, maker spaces now are really cool. I'm, I'm a huge fan, and I think they're great resources to have, especially on like campuses. I just will always, I'm always willing to do something, to go and do something, to, to wake up earlier or to sacrifice some more time somewhere or other. Um, the more you do it, the easier it gets. If you just constantly tell yourself, I'm going to go do that, I'm going to go do that. If it takes less than a minute, do it now. It's another mantra that I kind of live by. Curiosity, imagination, wonder, wonder. These were things, these were things my mom always also really encouraged in our household. I mean, we had things written all over my house um, that were, you know, off anything from the Einstein quote where he talks about how important curiosity is. Um, she would play classical, she did the classic stuff. She played classical music for us every night when we were going to bed. Uh, we would read all the time. We were constantly having stories, constantly playing games. We were not a video game or much of a screen house is the other thing. In fact, I went many years of my childhood without having basic cable. Um, we had a trampoline. We had games to play inside. We had dominoes and tinker toys and all the things that you can get your hands on. And I think that's what really helped foster my own sense of imagination and curiosity that I still carry. It was just the only thing I knew as a kid. Um, it was the way I was constantly entertaining myself. And then as you continue to grow up, your toys just get fancier and your piggy bank gets a little bit bigger and everything gets a little bit more satisfying and you're able to stretch your arm out a little bit farther and it just becomes more and more fun. At an early stage of pursuing mechanical engineering, there is this kind of realization I had that it's, I've, I was very fortunate in that I've picked a career path that gives me a lot of ability to help people and help the world and create things that can make lives better and the planet healthier. Um, and I saw that as a really powerful tool that could be leveraged to make a difference. I, I was very adamant that I didn't want to have a career that didn't mean anything um, and, and didn't leave a positive impact in, in its wake. So um, focusing on companies that I thought were making a difference in a, a positive way has always been very top of mind for me when I'm choosing or trying to interview places and, and expressing interest in different uh, career opportunities. So when NEO came along and it was electric vehicles, it was emerging technology, everything just kind of came together um, in a really meaningful way for me where I saw how big a difference uh, I was able to, to make especially it being um, based in China and the Chinese government pushing really hard to, to uh, get electric vehicles on the road um, to try to cut emissions. And um, I think being a part of that was really inspiring to me. I, I felt like, okay, I, I'm seeing that kind of perception that I have of engineering in like coming to, to fruition. So. That was a really big moment for me. Thanks for joining us for our special episode. Please come back next time by subscribing to the show on YouTube, Spotify, or Apple Podcasts. Until next time, think big, move fast, and make every connection count.